Welcome to They That Hope with Father Dave and Deacon Bob, seeing humor and hope in a crazy world. And I'm Deacon Bob. And I'm Father Dave. So some of the alumni, the, the, the ones that, you know, um, when we were up in Cleveland, right? Julie and Ryan, yeah. their kids dance when they hear this, when they hear the opening song. <laughs> nice. It's like, yeah, they start dancing. So. Oh, that's awesome. Well, we hope you kids enjoyed the dance and welcome everybody. Uh, Father Dave doesn't sound like he normally mm. does. And it's better now than it was. Really? Yeah. And we'll talk at the second in the second segment about my time in Washington. But on Friday, I I could hardly die. I sounded like I sounded like <laughs> you sound like Donald, you just smoked twelve like, like, like pack Donald, of cigarettes, yeah, or like Donald Duck on helium. Yeah. <laughs> so I was talking to my mom. She was, I hope you don't have to give a talk or something like that. And, and I really did not till Saturday. But yeah, no, that works out well. Out. We're doing an unusual recording because of our travels. It's Sunday night. I can't remember. We've ever recorded on a Sunday. I'm night. sure we have. We probably have. But the downside, of course, is that, you know, last week we did our Oscar <laughs> <laughs> predictions and we still don't know. By so the we'll, time we'll just make it up. If so you, you uh, by it's Wednesday, you've already realized that everything, everywhere, all at once won Best Picture, that Brendan Fraser gave a stunning speech for did winning. Did anyone get sla- slapped? Yeah. And that Jimmy Kimmel frequently made jokes yeah, yeah. about, I'm sure he probably came out and there was like security <laughs> lined up in the that's front right, ab- right, yeah. about it. So. Yeah, so I guess Chris Rock still hasn't forgiven him. Well, he needs to build a bridge. Yeah, I, actually, I don't think he feels that way at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think he needs to build a wall, and he's not necessarily wrong. Yeah, you're probably sometimes, right. sometimes walls are good things. So you're probably right. Um, sports, though, it's okay, ESPN meets Madness. EWTN. Yeah, March, let's talk about that. March Madness. So, so um, Big East tournament is always held in Madison Square Gardens in New York. My younger brother graduated from Marquette. Okay. Marquette's in the Big East. The first time they won the regular season. So he, he and his son went to the tournament. And Marquette won the tournament. Nice. And I, I texted him. I said, on a scale of 1 to 10, the last 48 hours. And he said, 17. It was yeah, just, that's I'm sure it was goal. just, you know, New York City's fun. Right, yeah. Big tournament. Madison Square Gardens. He was with his son. Actually, they got one of those micro rooms. What? It's a, like a micro room. I'll show you pictures of it later. It's like 100 square feet. It's bunk beds. <laughs> okay. You know, it's bunk beds. So it's a closet. Yeah, basically. But, yeah, I, he but we call me, it a micro room. He showed me a picture of it, and it has um, bathrobes hanging on it, which it just struck me funny. I mean, it's this teeny tiny room. But apparently it's the thing in New York now is you just micro rooms. You just want a place to stay. He said it's actually, it's really nice. It's just okay. really small. So it's just cheap. It's like cheaper than a hotel. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still not cheap. Right, but, but yeah. for for right for New York, for New York. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think um, that's also known as Europe. Oh, actually, don't like Europe. Like at times I've stayed in hotels rooms in Europe. I'm like, this isn't a. I yeah, can't even yeah, open. I, sh- I shouldn't have to pay for this. Yeah, yeah. But, I'm actually turning this on. So if we get some static, that's because I just turned because I have to check a score. Oh. Um, well, Purdue might have won the Big Ten uh, tournament, which is very extremely important, um, and Purdue. Did win. All right, so Purdue. Oh, they, they won. Purdue won the tournament, right? So we'll get the the pairings tonight, and uh, then next week we'll just talk all oh, wow. March Madness. Okay, that'll that's something to yeah, look forward to. Yeah, something to look forward to, folks. Hey, what's the school that Sister Jean goes to? Um, it's in it's in Chicago. It's at is Loyola. It? Oh, is it's it Loyola? Loyola in right. Chicago? Yeah. Did, are they going to make it? Uh, no idea. Okay. Yeah, we don't care about well, that. One of the things that's interesting is that you have this. You have your uh, conference championships. And if you win your championship, you make it to the playoffs. Okay. This one team lost 20 games this year. I think they only won like eight games, but they won their championship. So they're going? Yeah, they're total upsets. So they get to go. It's really interesting. And isn't that America? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of basketball, um, some NBA news. You know, things are heating up in the final stretch heading towards the playoffs. Uh, You might have heard that Kevin Durant joined your well, I say Phoenix. your Phoenix. Yeah, 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 that's probably too much. Yeah, more than anything. there you yeah. go. So they were going to be a super team, and as Kevin Durant was uh, getting ready for his first appearance, warming up, warming up, twists goes down, twists the ankle, four to six weeks. It was not meant to be. No, no, it's kind of a a cursed situation. I think so. Oh, he well. could still come back for playoffs if you guys make the playoffs, but. The West is wide open. Yes. I mean, the West is wide open. The Warriors the are not wild, doing well. wild, The wild, wild West. West. You know who's doing really well? The Lakers. Lakers are, are surging, even surging. with LeBron injured. Injured. Anthony Davis is uh, putting it on his shoulders. Putting it 
on his shoulder. But we're really rooting for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Yes, we are. And the Bruins are still, I think they just broke the record for most points. Okay, so season. that means it's they so won't early. get past the first round of playoffs if, and if that holds what up. What was the other thing? The golf today, uh, Scheffler won the Players' Champion, which is a big win. Okay. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, uh, NFL uh, quarterback uh, Jackson, Lamar Jackson, uh, uh, got the uh, franchise tag. He did, but he can still get traded. Right, somewhere. it's the minimum. It's the, it's right. the less less than yeah. Less so control. we'll see what happens. And did Aaron Rodgers make a decision about he's going still, to the Jets? He's, he's still in his silent cave. Yeah. Did you hear about that? Well, no. What he went in this apparently with like really rich thing. They go on this retreat. It's okay. called silent time. No dark darkness time or something like that. Oh. And they close him in a room without any light. And it's supposed to like be cleansing and that kind of thing. He did that for like five days. He probably spent like ten million dollars. Yeah, and experience. the joke was if he comes out and sees a shadow, he's going <laughs> to stay with the, <laughs> right. with the Packers. But Gosh, yeah, yeah, so. isn't that kind of what Descartes did? Like when he, I, I think he, he, this is the philosopher of the Enlightenment. I think he went into like a furnace, like just shut himself, like total sensory deprivation, and that's when he came out and he said. I think, therefore, I am. Because he was trying to figure out, how do I know I exist? Yeah, yeah. And it was because he realized, I'm thinking. Oh, yes, indeed. Well, we'd like to close with... We're no, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, we're closing, yeah. This, with, with the sport, yeah. 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 So um, We're we are going out on a limb on this one, A folks. little bit of a limb, but it's really exciting. So I don't know if you've heard the name Michaela Schifrin. Uh, you might have remembered the last... Was it the last no, Olympics? No, it, it was the previous one. It was the previous yeah. Olympics. She was... Uh, she was, uh, you know, highlighted as this is the, one of the greatest skiers of all time of, of you know, America's anything. great hope. But yeah. her, uh, her father had just passed away, mm -hmm. and, and she did horribly. I mean, she really did horribly in, in the Olympics. And sadly, sometimes that's like people remember what you do in the Olympics and right. nothing else. Well, um, Michaela Schifrin, uh, who is an American, I, I don't know where she's from. I know she went to, um, she went to USF, actually, University of South Florida. Which is an big, odd place. Big skiing big school. Big skiing school, I think. Big skiing school. Um, but she um, um, she just won her 87th World Cup race on Saturday um, by hundredths of a second, breaking the overall career World Cup victory. The, the original holder of this was a man from Sweden. His name was Igmar Stenmark, which sounds like, the kind of guy yeah, that would you're, you're be from friend. Sweden. That's and um, and he held it uh, for wins on the Alpine Skiing World Cup um, at age 32 in 1989. So she tied his record before breaking it on Saturday to become the winningest Alpine skier in history. It's interesting though. She says she didn't break the record. She's setting a new record. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, and it, she's really like she's really kind of inspiring. Um, she says. She, she's again, maybe they just say this because she wins all the time, but right. she said what's most important is that she skis the best that she can. She, she was she's really a, kind of cool. She's I like very, her. very cool. Yeah. I, I heard an interview with her early, you know, they I heard some clips of interviews with her, and she's actually kind of odd in that there's she's she's all about like the perfect curve, right, like right, skiing right. the perfect curve. And so there's times that she will actually come in second or third, and she'll be elated. Were you listening to the same she hit, podcast I was? Oh, I don't know. Was ESPN it an ESPN Daily? one? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Yeah, that was just so cool. She was talking, and then sometimes she'd win, and she'd be like, yeah, well, you know, I think I need to go look at that film. And So this isn't like an example of, you think of like a guy like Tom Brady who's like a competitor, yeah. you know, and it's all about... Be, you know, she seems to really be in it for the purity she says, of the right, sport. It's her in the mountain. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and I think, who is the previous, who is the most famous uh, female? Lindsay. Lindsay Vaughn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to compare, she won like 37. Mm -hmm. And now um, Michaela is at 87th. I mean, it's just actually people are saying there's almost nothing to compare this to. Like this, like in terms of this, if if we cared about skiing, we would have our minds being yeah, yeah, blown. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. this is bigger than Armstrong winning the Tour de France she, seven times. It was funny because in this podcast, you know, it talked about her um, being happy to come to the United States where nobody knows her. Yeah. Where in Europe, everybody knows, everybody knows her. She is like yeah. Like the goddess. most famous American right, right, ever. Right. Yeah. And yeah, it's yeah. like, what? No, it was really cool. Um, was it, was so something? USA, good job. Good job, Michael. USA. Yep, USA. I'm so happy. Yeah. Have you ever skied? So, um, yes, I skied. It wasn't pleasant. Do you want to talk more about well, this? Well, I tried to ski, and then 
what I didn't like about skiing is the ski, well, the ski lift is a nightmare. And um, then there's the skis that like come off, like while you're skiing, that's not good. And then it just keeps going down the hill. And now you have one ski in these poles. So then somebody said, you should try snowboarding. That's good it's idea. actually Mike Manhart who suggested yeah, this. That's and a good idea, Mike. so uh, we were in Colorado, and I think it was called Copper Top. Is that a name of a place? Copper, uh, is there maybe. something with a copper in it? Copper Mountain. Yeah, maybe. Co- coppers and robbers. Mm-hmm. And so um, the, he said the nice thing about the snowboard is that you don't have poles mm-hmm. and you're strapped in. You can't physically lose your board, which was true. And the other nice thing that I learned is that I keep falling. But, like, other really good snowboarders keep falling, partly because they're trying to do, like, 360-degree mm-hmm. backflips, and I'm just trying to go in a straight line. But, like, we're all covered in snow. So you don't look weird being covered in snow as a snowboarder. I can't tell you how much I would love to go skiing with you. Well, I did it. So I, I did the whole mountain run Attaboy. from top to bottom. I went right in the lodge. I, I gave back the snowboard, and I just sat in the lodge the rest of the day. It was a lovely day. <laughs> yeah, and I've never done Guinness. it since. That was probably... A Guinness. Gosh, I was... That was at least 20 years ago, maybe. No. I obviously, I grew up in Colorado. Do you go Col- skiing? I, well, I don't here, but I grew up in Colorado, so I skied all the time. In Durango? Yep. And then when I was in Gomming, I skied. I had season pass and skied all the time. Okay. But here, I think I would just be frustrated because there's a ski area about an hour and a half away. Seven, seven Springs. Seven Springs, yeah. right. So when it's all said and done, it's expensive. It would probably cost if I went. Too when it's all said and done, probably $150. Yeah. And it takes like four minutes to, to get to the, the bottom yeah, of the so slope. I'm just not going to do it. Yeah. I refuse. Good job. There you go. You got to stand up for your principles. Amen. This is when everyone's hitting the 30 second fast forward. That's right. But don't. Go ahead. Don't. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. It's Everybody about the conferences. Says, but do. actually, this is pretty cool. Uh, if I can bring it up. Come to the conferences this summer. Oh, there it is. Our students might be on spring break this week, but Father Dave and I are already looking forward to the summer because registration for the summer Steubenville Summer Conferences are now open. Woo! So come join us, Franciscan University's campus, for any of our five adult conferences, starting with the Power and Purpose Conference from June 9th through 11th. For high schoolers, we also have four youth conferences on campus, plus regional conferences in 12 cities across the United States and Canada. Canada. So there's sure to be a conference near you. Each Duvimo conference is filled with inspiring speakers, fellowship, music, and most importantly, an encounter with Jesus Christ. We hope you'll join us this summer. Learn more about our adult and youth conferences at studentvilleconferences.com. That's studentvilleconferences.com. People should come. Yeah, they're really great conferences. conferences. I mean, I know many of you listeners do come, and it's going to be great. Uh, Another wonderful summer. Uh, I hope more people are coming back to conferences. I don't know if we've... Have we overcome our our COVID I don't think so. It's funny. I was watching the news yesterday, and they had this thing uh, up in Canada in the parliament. Okay. Everybody in the parliament is still in masks. Oh. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. And then going to the airport this morning, the taxi guy had it, the radio on. He said um, they did a study and people who are more apt to wear masks now are people who don't think they're very attractive. <laughs> he said they did <laughs> the study. so wrong. Right? Well, they said they, they did the study and people who consider themselves um, more attractive or less likely to wear masks. Okay. So this, so is, this is legitimate statistical data from a cab driver. That's right. Um, yeah, well, speaking of conferences, uh, I was at a conference this weekend that was great. Uh, friends, we we talked about this, I think, at least in a yeah the uh, the <laughs> journalism in a post truth. You did it at the Bible Museum, right? Which is really beautiful yeah. and, and wonderful. Tell me a little bit more about the Bible Museum because I'm actually curious about it. Like, okay, did you get to go through it or um, I, I not not extensively? Yeah, because no, you're busy doing the conference. Right, right. Yeah, I hear it is really cool though. It's beautiful and the view. I mean, it's just it's I, I believe. It cost four hundred million dollars. Wow, to create. it's just beautiful. But um, yes, yeah, so I uh, backtrack. Two years ago, I was at another conference, and myself and a guy by the name of Dr. Matthew Bunsen, who works with EWTN. This was when COVID was going crazy. Nobody knew. It's like right. if you watch one news channel, you're going to die tomorrow, and if you watch another one, you just right. you need to put a little bit of dirt on it. You're going to be fine. <laughs> right. So I was saying, you know, what's I mean, what is truth anymore? You just don't know. And yeah. 
And then I said, we should do something. We should, is, we, we should collaborate and do some conference on media and truth, journalism and truth. So yeah. that's what it was, was journalism in a post-truth uh, world. It was really fantastic. It was, um, one of the things that I wanted was like a really conversational. Mm -hmm. So there was only two like keynotes okay. and the rest was panels. Okay. So we dealt with things like what is journalism, which was what we started with. What is bi bias in journalism, mm -hmm. which was just fascinating. These are all people who work in the field. Yeah. Who you are know, some of the names? Do you remember? Yeah. I mean, Terry Mattingly is one who's, he, he did a Got Religion. Okay. Um, the religion person from Fox News, I can't remember who she, had, what, what her name was. Laura Teresa Green, Tomeo? Maybe, no. She was there. She okay. was one of them, too. Okay. Um, a woman from CNN. Uh, oh. Mary Catherine Hammer, maybe? Okay. Um, so it was a really a good group of people. Was Raymond Aurora there? He wasn't. He oh, wasn't. Oh, I uh, thought he was going to be. Tracy Selva was there, who okay. does the news. Mm -hmm. um, Monse uh, Alvarado was there. She's at EWTN. Hmm. Michael Warsaw was the president of EWTN. Yeah. But they were great. So the, some of the other topics were, um, yeah, bias in journalism. How do you cover the Catholic Church? Hmm. You know, in, in how it's covered. Another one was how do Catholics... How does being a Catholic impact how you do the media and how you do journalism, which was great. But a couple of things that were interesting, we had uh, ex-Congressman Lipinski, was really, in, he was from Illinois. Tara Lipinski? He, yeah, 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 yeah. You didn't know that he went on and became I, a congressman? I didn't know that, that she became, became a man he, and, then and then he became a congressman. A congressman. Yeah, that, that was, actually seems like a fitting story. He was actually the last pro-life Democrat. Okay. And, um, yeah, the, he just basically... The media just turned on him. The Democratic Party just turned on him, and he got voted out. I mean, one year, one term, he won by like 42 points, and then the abortion lobby pumped millions of dollars in this, wow. and, and he ended up losing. So one, there's no more pro-life There's no pro-life. He was the last pro-life oh Democrat. Oh, my gosh. It was, yeah. really, it was really cool having him come in because a Catholic, very faithful Catholic, but also, like you said, look at my record. Apart from abortion, I vote Democrat. Yeah. You know, he was really believed that, but he always voted pro-life. Yeah. And it was the last one. And he said it's really sad that, and he really talked about how the Orthodox, and Republicans have this the same as, as well. He said that there was a Republican that got forced out because he, he said that maybe climate change is a reality. And, <laughs> yeah. And he didn't get reelected. So, yeah. But the, the line he had this, I thought that was really beautiful. He said, um, truth is not left the world. The world is left truth. And it was just really interesting because we talked about if if there is no truth. I mean, the the purpose of journalism is to get to the facts, right? To get what is what are the facts? Well, alleged. I mean, that's what it used to be at least. Exactly. That's that's what it was supposed to be, but it's not anymore. I mean, th there were so many instances of people telling stories about it's it's just about trying to um, no longer journalism. It's really activism. Okay. You know, what's your cause? What do you want to try to convince people into? And I, I said at the very beginning that I'm here as a consumer. I'm, obviously, I don't live in a world of journalism. But on my phone, if you look at my phone, I've got CNN, Fox News, and USA Today. Mm. And I hopefully, between the three of those, <laughs> right. you know, you can find out what happened. But it was just, it was a really interesting conversation. This guy by the name of Terry Maddenly, who I think it, it's maybe called Got Religion. Okay. He's big about... Um, the, the the church the Catholic Church is one of the few institutions that stands against the media. Mm. And he's really he's not, he's actually Orthodox. He loves Franciscan University because he says we're we're willing to stand up. But he said that the church has got to prepare. Like one of his lines, he continually says the church has to prepare people for what's coming because mm. he said it's not going to get any better. Things are going to get worse. The media there, there are as you know this whole thing with Twitter and Twitter controlling media and controlling what was released before the last election. He said, yeah. you know, the fact that we've got major companies like that that are deciding what you get to see, yes. and what you get to read, what's quote unquote truth and this misinformation. So it was just, it was a great conference. <clears throat> the other thing that was cool, it was just kind of nice. It was stimulating my mind, mm -hmm. you know, just to hear things, you know, I, I don't delve a lot into the freedom of speech and, and right. religion. One of the in battles we had was um, freedom of speech and religion worldwide. So we had people from three different countries. And it was just fascinating what yeah. we did with that. So, What other countries? Um, Spain, United States, and S South America. Peru. Okay. Peru or Chile. I can't remember. Yeah. 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 So it was, it was really, it was a great conference. And I was just proud of our alumni. We had alumni that are out there that are working in journalists and doing yeah. really cool things. Uh, so it was great. Do you remember Jeanette DeMello? Yeah. Jeanette was there. She okay. did great. Yeah. Uh, so it was great. It was a great time. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was there a good turnout to it? 
Yeah, we were hoping for 200. It's kind of a niche thing. We had about 170 sure. that were in purpose and yeah. about 200 online. Yeah. Um, can people watch it online? Eventually. Okay, eventually, so we'll pr- yeah. I'm sure we'll yeah. make an yeah. announcement about that when that actually comes to. Do you read the news, watch the news? How do you? So I do a similar thing. I, I, uh, I, I do like a news briefing every day through my Amazon Alexa, but I have it do, the Fo- I have it do Fox and I have it do NPR. Mm-hmm. And yeah, sometimes it feels like there's completely two different worlds uh, going on. But yeah, I, I do a similar thing. I'll, I'll try to look at AP News online if there's a story I'm interested in. And um, yeah, just it, it does feel like you need to kind of float around to different news sources. I do like seeing things on CNN just because I'm trying to also get a sense of what are other people thinking. I think we might have talked about this uh, documentary on, I think it's on Netflix, The Social Dilemma. Yeah, yeah. And it was... Um, very eye-opening because many of the folks in social media who helped create social media algorithms, you know, the, the goal was it wants to curate what you want to see and what you want to hear so that you can come to this portal, you can come to the Facebook, whatever it would be, and you get to see the stuff that you want to see. Well, the downside was that that started to happen with the news, and now all of a sudden you get to see the news that you want to see. No, and that's what I talked a lot about. And that. that becomes your lens. And then the problem is somebody else is looking at completely different news. So your news is saying that those people are idiots, but yeah. their news is saying that you're an idiot. And then when you guys talk to each other, it's like, well, you're clearly an idiot. No, you're clearly an idiot because no one's watching the same. Well, news. and that's one of the things they stress is is to have relationships with people who think differently than yeah. you. And we're so intimidated by that, you know. It, to go out to dinner with somebody who's whatever right. you you picked it, and they said it's especially for journalists, but they said for everybody. Yeah. Here was one of the things that I thought that was really fascinating. This guy that said that they were talking about the Catholic vote, and they they all laughed at that because there isn't a Catholic vote, mm. right? To think that all so there's what, an organization called Catholic Vote. Yeah, which were there, they were there. Okay, with yeah. us, which was good. But this one guy who did this study, and he said you could basically um, break Catholic voters into four groups: ex Catholics. They always vote Democrat. Cultural Catholics, they mostly vote Democrat. And by cultural Catholic, they were born and raised Catholic. They may go to Mass every now and then. Maybe Christmas, maybe Easter kind of. Right, right, right. Yeah, sure. And then these what he calls the Sunday morning Catholics. And those are the people that basically go to Mass every week. Mm-hmm. It's important to them, you know, but that's about all that they do. He said that that population decides who gets elected in the United States. Really? Because the fourth section, he said, um, and that those are the swing votes, and the fourth section of Catholics is Catholics who go to Mass and go to confession. Huh. And he said that the Catholics who regularly go to Mass and regularly go to confession almost always vote Republican. Interesting. So he said that that group is where the battle is yeah. for, for that population. They go to church, but... Not a lot other than that. So it was really, it was really a great conference. Yeah, that yeah, is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's, it really is tragic just in terms of the political sphere. Well, I mean, f- on so many levels. I, I think it's so ridiculous that any party has abortion or pro-life as their, like, like I don't see. Platform. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know what that has to do with Democrat or Republican. Like, it seems like almost foreign to the idea of the way these parties see governance. And, you know, even if, you know, as you're talking about this pro life Democrat, there's, I, I know many people who are like, well, actually, I'm definitely more of the Democrat in terms of, you know, just policy, policy, yeah, yeah, yeah. some of the key, you know, what are the most important things going on? And they would say, you know, Im, you know, immigration and uh, environment, and, you know, whatever. all that. But then there's this dumb thing that they also say, oh, and by the way, we're the party that, you know, is going to increase killing, abortions. Killing we're exactly going to be the right. party that's going to be, you know, really strong on transgender and letting kids get medication without their parents. You know, like, and so I, it, it's just a difficult thing, you know, and I, and it's something I think we all it, it's almost like everything's kind of been hijacked in different things because as as somebody who is Republican, there's things I don't like about the Republicans, sure, sure. you know, but I guess at the end of the day, it's almost what's the lesser of the evils, and then you just wish maybe it wasn't 
it wasn't that bad. But then you get to the news and you really have a tough time trying no, to figure a, out, right. you know, what, what's going on with anything. And the thing about it is the reality is, is to really get at what, what the news is, you have to do some work. And yeah. truth be told is most people aren't willing to do that. No, you, know, just, you, you watch one thing, bite. you watch, and that's the other thing. Yeah, you get the sound bite. Um, one of the things that we talked about was really interesting was how the media covered the Pope. Like okay. the Pope came out today uh, and gave this big presentation about how awful uh, the transgender ideology is. Really? I can bet you a million dollars CNN won't cover that tomorrow. Yeah. But if he came out and said, like he did, which is, he said homosexual should not, is not a crime. Right, should not he be. Said, right. He said it is a sin, which CNN didn't pick up on. They just said, Pope says homosexuality is not. It will be interesting. I'm going to watch the news tomorrow and see if what they say about his gender yeah. ideology comment. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. I love the thing, maybe just to include in it, you know, the idea of just being with other people and other mindsets. You know, that's... That's how you and I hang out. Yeah, but that's, I, that's exactly where I was going to go right. with it. Yeah. No, but I even think of how uh, how blessed I am as a Catholic to hang out with Protestants who are active in their faith. Mm-hmm. And, um, and just the perspective, the conversations, I mean, it's not even an apologetic. It's just, okay, there's people who love Jesus, who love Jesus in a very different way than I do. And... That's awesome. Yeah, you know? it's interesting. It, it's just it's just so cool to find the commonality among people who are supposed to be opposites from us. I mean, the world just wants to make everything divisive, and this there's is, so much we have. We have there's so much more in common. This is kind of maybe tangential, but there was a podcast that I listened to, and there was an individual that was a guest fairly off, fairly often, and just talks sports, and he's kind of funny. He's kind of nerdy. He's Catholic, kind yeah. of. So I just kind of like sounds the guy. like me. Um, Kind of funny, kind of nerdy. About you. This, is, this, is, this is exactly this is, right. This is speaking with deacons. Right, right. You're speaking with deacons. You <laughs> right, didn't want right, to promote exactly, me on the show. Exactly. Well, as it turns out, this guy is total lib with, CN- with CNN. Okay. But it's interesting because had I not known that, I kind of like the guy. Yeah. You know, he's, again, he's funny and this. So if, I if, if the starting point would have been me knowing how liberal and how progressive and crazy whacked he is with CNN, I probably never would have given him a shot of even listening yeah. to him. So yeah. it's, it's, it's important for us to be able to talk about that. Well, and then also we don't divine, de- define each other by the ideology. I think yeah. that's another thing. Yeah. Like yeah. people are just wonderful and you can find great oh. friendships and of people that might have different political views, religious views, and like, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. can still actually like the person, you know? I mean, I think that's, that's right. it, more important, you know, than some of those things. Jesus probably would have dinner with a pro-choice Democrat. Yeah. I mean, and, and it would drive the pro-life Republican crazy, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. Speaking of driving people crazy, I just want it's to... my life story. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, just some emails uh, that we're getting, and yes, that's what I'm going to talk about. Well, so Virginia was nice enough. Would you promote discount codes? First of all, was terribly disappointed that there was no they that hope discount for the pilgrimage to Gomming. I, I, I agree with her on that one. Oh, I'll figure something out. Really? Yeah, All right. Maybe Exciting. Like 25 bucks or so. Yeah. No, a beer with me. We'll have a beer there together you go. and I'll All buy right. it. All right. I'll buy it. Um, there was no discount code for para prayer rosaries, and I totally messed that one up. Because so, there is? Because there is. Yeah, he sent me that in the email, and I just forgot about it. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about these wonderful rosaries made Which we by- have some. This is, these are great. Yeah, they're really, really I like cool. how small they are. Yeah, yeah, they're super small and super light. Um so the promo code is Bob and Dave. I'm glad I'm finally getting top billing on this mm-hmm. one. Bob and Dave, which gets 25% off the original, whatever the original is. It's, it's one of the thing. But he's a Franciscan grad uh, doing a small business. What's the website again? Uh, it's paraprayers.com, P-A-R-A-P-R-A-Y-E-R-S.com. Uh, they're all customizable. You can add a crucifix, St. Medals, other cool stuff. Mine he said is- actually a number of people have... Uh, gotten them and he's really appreciates it. He's just a great dude, a great family. Mine is red, him. white, and blue. Washington D.C. Because he's a, he's a D.C. fan guy. He loves the Capitals. He loves you the know. Nats. So he, so he's not perfect. Yeah. So I was in D.C. This conference took place in D.C. and I was downtown just by myself getting a bite to eat when the Caps were playing. It was kind of fun just being down there. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of activity. A lot now of they're things. not. Um, the season hasn't started though yet. Baseball? No, uh, no, we're still spring training. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But are they in? They're down in Florida. Oh, the Caps, the hockey yeah, the team. Caps, yeah. The hockey yeah, 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 team. Yeah, yeah, I got confused caps. for a second. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. So, good times. Good. 
We now move on to our final segment of the podcast, and we have been taking a look at the upcoming Sunday Gospel readings. Which is long. Again. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, um, I, as the deacon, did the... Um, my, my, my priests are always like, always the longer form, always the longer form. I'm like, all right. I mean, it's, it was the entire John chapter four mm-hmm. thing. I felt like in the middle, I wanted them just to sit down and just, just take a take nap. A breath. Or do we'll something have like some that. water. I, was, I, I said before, I'm like, no, I could do the longer form. I'll just throw in John chapter three at no additional cost yeah, that's you right. know, and just see how, see how that goes. But, um, you know, it was but you know, it's interesting though, because if you actually did the brief, the shorter version, yeah. It says, did you look at what is skipped? No. It just says, um, she says, you skipped the part that says. When the disciples come back? No, no, you, you skipped that too. But you skipped the part where he says, you know, call your husband. You have five. They I, skipped I, that part? Yeah, but it picks up. It says, I, I see that you're a prophet. It's like, when you read it, it's like, <laughs> well, how do you see that you're a prophet? You missed that whole right. part. So yeah. I tend to agree. Yeah. And the, the gospels are so rich. I, I, exactly. But we're not going to read it here. But all that being said is we're not going to read the gospel again. We, I think we just decided we're just not going to do What'd that. What'd you do with my rosary? Uh, you threw Never it. I got it. There it is. There it is. There it is. Um, so the gospels for this, the gospel for this Sunday, is again from the Gospel of John. It's John chapter nine, and it was a story of Jesus, um, who came up to a, a man who was blind, and the disciples asked him an interesting question: Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind, which really gives like an insight into how people saw suffering back Mm -hmm. then. You know, the idea was if you... What do you mean back then? Well, you're right. Absolutely. I was going to make the connection. Okay. But I was starting with the literal sense, and then I was going to move to the spiritual sense. It's in Laban. Yeah, exactly. So, but just that idea that if, um, if you're handicapped, if you're suffering, if you're poor, you must have done something to deserve it. If you're blessed, if things are great, well, then God is smiling upon you. And, of course, the cross will radically contradict all of, all of that stuff. But as did Jesus, and he said, you know what? Neither he nor his parents. It's though the works of God might be made visible. And so when he said this, he did a weird thing. He spat on the ground. He made clay with the saliva, smeared the clay on his eyes, and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And that, that means sense. And so he went and washed and came back able to see. And I was actually reading something that St. Augustine wrote about this. He talked about how just as man was made out of clay uh, with the breath of God in it, that the living water, Christ, is putting water into the clay Mm, of the earth and using it to heal him. So he goes off to the pool, but he doesn't see Jesus. He just, I I assume somebody helps him to the pool. That would be kind of a weird thing if 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 he doesn't do that. And people started being like, wait, this is the guy that we've always seen. And some said, it is. No, it just looks like him. So they said, how did you get your eyes opened? And he said, well, this guy named Jesus did it. And, they're, and they say, where is he? And he's like, I don't know. So now the Pharisees get upset. And the Pharisees are like, all right, how did this happen? And he said, well, Jesus did this for me. And the Pharisees said, well, this man isn't from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. This happened on the Sabbath. And... Uh, and they, and they were arguing with him. They brought his parents in, and um, you know the parents were afraid to say anything except, well, he was born blind, he's of age, go question him. So then the Pharisees bring him back, and they say, give God the praise. We know this man is a sinner. And he replied, if he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know is that I was blind, and now I see. So they kick him out, and he's like, you know, Jesus heard that they'd thrown him out, so he found him. And he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him. The one speaking with you is he. And he said, I do believe, Lord. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, I've come into this world for judgment so that those who do not see might see and that those who see might become blind. And um, it, 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 first of all, I just find it to be a fascinating story. It is. You know, like it's this, a great story. You know, like it, all this going John back is, and John forth. Is great John is great. John, you know, if you, if you read the Gospels, uh, one of the neat things about John is he really takes his time with stories. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just a quick. Some of the some of the other synoptic Gospels can be a little bit quick and terse about things. Just but the he, facts. He really gets into it, and just this whole thing of they're talking to his parents, and now he's back, and now the Pharisees, and this whole thing is going on, and then this poor guy's just kicked out, and Jesus is like, "Hey, do you believe in me?" And but this beautiful thing of yes, I believe and worship him, and and this line that Jesus says, "The one speaking with you is he," is reminiscent exactly of what we just heard this last Sunday. You know, with I hear a Messiah mm-hmm. is coming, the one speaking to you is he. 
And this revelation that Jesus is giving to us through his healing and through power. But what I find most intriguing for the gospel is this idea of the witness of the blind man. Mm. That he's just, you know, when you have a witness, um, people can't argue against it. When they see a changed life, and I I often share this with my students. I teach a num- well, I teach in our major in catechetics and evangelization, and we have our students memorize uh, the the saying from um, Saint Paul the Sixth that modern men listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers, and to teachers only if they are witnesses. And the beautiful thing about a witness is it's your witness. I can say that Jesus changed my life, and I can talk about ways in which Jesus changed my life. And it's not a polemical argument. It's not a theolo- mm-hmm. It's not theology. It's just simply, this is what he's done for me. You know, I think of that beautiful line in The Chosen, you know, well, I was, I was, I was one, on one way, I was another, and he was in between. And and the fact that even after this healing, Jesus comes and finds him. He goes through all these difficult things, and he's defending Jesus and doesn't even know who Jesus is. And yeah, well, that's that. I, Bobby, I think that's really, really beautiful what you're talking about because that's that's it's that's one of the things I love about the scriptures. That's not where I would have gone, mm-hmm. and that that's what jumped out to you is cool. Yeah. But but that's absolutely the case, and in, in we're on this totally on the same page with that. That when you talk about what the Lord has done for your life, you you can't argue that. Yeah. You know, it's like. It's not a dogma. It's just, all right, this is how the Lord broke. And I love this, that in this story, he's like, he doesn't have a clue. He's not worried <laughs> no about idea. the theology. Right. He's, all he knows is this guy, and he had this encounter with this guy, and he's different now. Right. And that's so powerful to be able to experience. And that's why it's important that everybody is able to share their witness. Right. And there's some of you who are right now thinking, well, I really don't have a witness. You do. You have a great witness. You do. You've got to be able to take a step back. And maybe 30 seconds, you want to tell somebody how to do that. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. And I would say um, I often joke when I'm at conferences mm-hmm. that I have a lame witness, uh, you know, because I didn't do anything dramatic. I didn't do anything like that. Um, God really preserved me and drew me closer to his heart. But I think the beautiful thing about witnesses is I, when I share that, I have so many people who come and talk to me later because they're moved by that because that feels like their life. And that's really one of the powerful things about the witness is we need to hear a lot of different witnesses and a lot of things that are present. So I think one of the best things when you share your witness is really what has the Lord changed in your life? How has he set you free? How has he given you gifts? It doesn't need to be dramatic. You know, I think sometimes that's the that's the stereotype like, oh, I'm supposed to have like, you know, been on drugs mm-hmm. and been in a gang and been in prison. It's, it's like, well, that's th- those are inspiring, but those don't like make me go sure, holiness. Sure, I'm just sure. like, that's awesome. Good for, for you. you. For you, for you. Right. Right, right, right. But I think it's more just the day-to-day lives. You know, I've, I find actually a lot of times uh, lately, I've just been sharing the witness of the grace of the sacrament of marriage as I've been talking to, you know, other brothers in Christ or about, you know, just like this idea that I try to consciously draw from that grace. You know, right. like just, we believe Christ is present in the Eucharist. Why do we forget he's present in marriage? I, right. As a married person, right, I think right, we right. can do that. And it, that's a small witness. Like a witness isn't like, well, let me tell you my whole life's testimony. It's also just certain aspects of your life that you can say, I know God has been doing great things because in my own selfish sense, I would have reacted this way. But then I just had this movement of grace where I, where I said something different, and there's been great fruit from that. So. Yeah. I don't know if you have other thoughts on terms of sharing a witness or no, but I think that that's great. But just to be able, I think sometimes it takes a little bit of work. You know, yeah. I encourage people just take a piece of paper and if you were to write a timeline of your spiritual life, mm. and that we've probably had markers in our life. Oftentimes, it's around the sacraments, and at that point, I invite them to even something different because oftentimes, we we don't necessarily make a distinction between the sacrament or the church and Christ. And, and by that, I mean that I've had encounters with Jesus outside of the Eucharist, you know, yeah. um, in, in a prayer or a spiritual experience outside or something like that. Right. So just think of a timeline of your spiritual life and just with a word or two mark, okay, I remember this time and I remember this time. And then you see that there are markers in your life that have kind of guided yeah. you along. Yeah. It's beautiful. You just mentioned without the sacraments, you know, I, I St. John of the Cross, who was one of the great spiritual writers of all time, somebody pointed out that he wrote Dark Night of the Soul, which is considered to be one of the great spiritual masterworks, when he was trapped in a basement 
uh, because his brothers wouldn't let him go. He had no access to any sacraments whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> and God found himself. Yeah. yeah, but God found, uh, you know, God found him there, and he was able to encounter God in in a deeper and profound way. But that, that really does. It just gets to what has God done in my life? Um, how has he changed me? I think the change is good. And, I, and the last thing I usually say about witnesses is if you do have some kind of level of sin or woundedness and stuff, don't talk about that so much. Like, talk more about Jesus and the freedom. Because I've heard sometimes what witnesses, done. yeah, what has he done? It's not, mm-hmm. like, what you've done is not that interesting. We're all sinners. We're all broken. What he's done, that's the really interesting thing and and how that's available for all of us. I mean, that's the witness of this guy. He just talked about, I once was blind, but now I can see. And and I like that. I like that idea of if you've never done it, writing out a narrative because one last thing before you and then you can share what you thought of the gospel i think of the line from saint peter he talks about always proclaim christ holy in your heart and be ready to give reason for the hope that you have received Mm -hmm. which is to say proclaim christ holy in your heart live a holy life live a life of filled with the fruits of the spirit the love the joy the peace the faithfulness the self-control the things that only the holy spirit can really give us but be ready don't be caught unawares when someone says so how how are you able to have that perspective or do that? Don't go, I, 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 I go to church. Just nice. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, I don't know. It's just something about me. I've always had that way. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. So, like, you should have it in your back pocket. Like, be ready to say, well, actually, Jesus changed, <laughs> Jesus changed my life. And that might be a little bit scary, but you know what? You're just sharing your witness, and they asked. Mm-hmm. And that can be a powerful means if, if we just did that more often well, as Catholics. And we see that, obviously we see that in the last two Sundays is you've got the woman who right? goes back to the village and says, let me tell you what he's done. And yeah. this, this guy doesn't even totally know what happened. He just knows he can see. But he just knows what he did. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they tell the story. The one, may, maybe just the one thing I would pick up that is a little bit different and it's, it's obviously self-evident and that is who can actually see. Hmm. You know, Paul, John is playing with his who's blind and who sees. And yeah, right. beginning of the story, it's it's evident that the blind man's blind and the Pharisees see. And when it's all over, the blind man was the one who was able to see and the Pharisees are the one who were blind. Yeah. He, I love it. And he says, um, you know, there's, there's asking him, the Pharisees ask him all this. And he says, this is what is amazing to me that you do not know where he is from yet. And he goes through this whole thing. This, right. this blind man is literally catechizing these people. That, that <laughs> yeah. Their whole life was dedicated to this. Yeah. And, but, but again, the, I, I think the danger is, we we put the sinner right in a box. So he's mm. the sinner. So we're obviously not going to be able to learn anything from him because he's the sinner. It goes back to what we were talking earlier of, um, I think God God wants to use everybody that's around us to help bring it, bring us to him and help us yeah. to see him. I remember when I was in seminary, there was this nun. Um, I was working in a hospital. She and I could not have been, been more different, mm. you know, if it was black, I said it was white. I mean, she was so kind of progressive and all this, that, and the other. And I kind of put her in a box. It's like, oh, I mean, she didn't dress like a nun and this, and the other. Uh, and then working, we, we were assigned to the same area in the hospital. And then working with her, she was amazing. Yeah. I mean, the way that she she ministered to people, people who were dying, their families, unbelievable. Yeah. And it, unfortunately, it took me a while for me to kind of Realize, okay, this woman can teach you a lot, Dave. You may not yeah. agree, honestly, on hardly anything theologically, but this woman really... She loves. Yeah, yeah, and, and ministers to these people and is present and sees them and has empathy and, yeah, so it's, yeah, who's the sinner? Who's able to see and who's not able to see? Let's let's realize that God wants to use both of those people to be able to speak to us. One piece of advice, I don't know, you might not remember giving this to me, but maybe you've said it a, a bit um, even when I was in college and you were still a brother, but you, you said uh, something along the lines of, you know, you know, when you're studying the faith, you know, it can seem like it's all about liberal and conservative. Mm-hmm. But when you're doing ministry, it's about being faithful or not faithful. Mm-hmm. Because what you can find, and I, I tell students this, I'm like, you can find some, you know, orthodox conservative folk who only care that, the, the T's are, you know, right. and the I's are dot, and it's just about, and that's what the faith is, and it's not about loving other people or, right, you know, right, really right. doing the ministry of the gospel, and, and, and vice versa. You know, you can find, and, and, at, and when you're in ministry, you just realize, like, yeah, actually, there's lots of people with lots of different thoughts and, and different ecclesiologies and different formations and different backgrounds. The question is, like, who's, 
who's living the gospel, like who is giving their life to do it. I had an experience when I was a youth minister in Albany, and I, I, uh, I went to the first you know youth minister meeting. I was the only guy there. I was the only person in his twenties. You know, it was the rest was women in their fifties. We did this prayer service where they passed around a pine cone. And we had to close our eyes and, so cool. and you know, how do you feel God in this? And they were singing some, some song in Hawaiian, I kid you not. I thought they were praying in tongues, but then I realized it was like a Hawaiian song. And so at the first break, I just left. I'm like, I'm out of here. And I went to the parking lot. And at the time, I had a pretty beat up Toyota Corolla and my back seat was filled with kid stuff because it was a, you know, youth ministry thing. And I looked at all the other cars and they were all pieces of crap. And it just hit me, all these women up here have devoted their lives to get paid poorly and try to minister the gospel to teenagers. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I can find something yeah, in common. Yeah, and, I, and I went back and I was blessed for that because in a <laughs> similar way, I learned so much. I mean, I knew great theology, but just some wonderful people. Amen. So, hey man, maybe the last thing, just as we, we close up with prayer, um, we had a very sad thing happen on campus yeah. on Friday afternoon. Uh, one of our students, uh, she passed away. She'd had some some health issues. We certainly didn't think, nor did her family think, that it was going to uh, lead to her death. But she died uh, in in a residence hall on Friday afternoon. So uh, Cassie Martinez mm. uh, is with the Lord, and we just ask that people would pray for her, pray for mom and dad. Her brother, she was a a sophomore English major here at the university. Her brother is a junior. Yeah. So just keep the Martinez family and keep Cassie in your prayers, mm. and, and for the, her household, it just you know, things like that just really, really shake up the, the student body and, and, and the friars, everybody involved. So well, Especially with so many students leaving and yeah, going on yeah, mission yeah, trips. Yeah. So, and, so uh, keep, keep Cassie and, and her family in your prayers. Yeah, and as I just say that also, uh, just pray for our students. We have so many of our mm-hmm. students going on mission trips uh, all around the world, doing great stuff. Um, pray for their safety. Yeah, amen. Heavenly Father, in this uh, third week of Lent, we ask your blessing upon us. Uh, heal our blindness so that we're able to see. Yes, you Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Have a good week, Bob. Thanks. Boy, that was a long podcast. I know. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. We look forward to seeing you next week. And if you want to send us an email, hope at franciscan.edu. That's hope at franciscan.edu. God bless. Yeah.